pastor's child. Pastor Manny was horrible. You know, I was in the drug scene and living life as I wanted it. But the Lord knew the perfect timing when to come out. And it was a journey. And I tell you what, it says in Galatians chapter 4, 4, in the fullness of time. Amen. That's a very powerful word phrase. It's only used in the word of God twice. In the fullness of time. Why use a word phrase like this? It, he was trying to describe that when it was God's appointed time. You know, in the earth right now, we consider that man is dominating and dictating times and seasons. Politics, Facebook, TikTok, people sort of move with the time and the season as they're determined by these social media platforms. And, um, you know, some people will tell you, well, now it's the era of R&B or it's the era of hip hop or it's the era of, um, you know, uh, the political arena. Of, of, of now social media and we've got these giant tech companies all over the earth all that aside I want you to understand God and in him all things consist just you got to nail that down you've got to understand that God is God and in him all things consist by him and through him says the word Colossians in the word of God is very clear so even though man right now is the legal entity God uses to administrate in the earth, the preeminence of it is coming out from the spirit dimension. God has already set a time. He's determined things that must take place in this dimension that we call the physical. God is in spirit, but God uses this dimension and he releases all that he wants through you and I. God is about using man. You are the legal entity that God wants to use this morning. That pole there cannot do what God wants me to do. So God has created you and I as instruments of righteousness in order for to communicate with us to express His divine will. Somebody shout amen this morning. I am here for the single purpose to express my Father's will. You know, Jesus was the highest level, the complete level, if you want to say that, of what it looks like to be expressing the fullness of the Godhead in the earth. It says in the Word of God that without hearing from the Father, He would not speak. Without seeing what the Father was doing in the Spirit, He would not do. Jesus was led by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, to a point that everything that he was doing was accordance to the Word of God. And I just want to put it out there this morning that if you want to grow this morning, understand your calling in God. You are created to express His will. You're not just a teenager. You're not just a grandmother. You're not just a mother or a wife. You are also a child of the living God. Yes. You, you are a child of the living God, so you have the inheritance, the rights to express the will of the Father in its fullness, in its time that God is going to determine what he needs to do through you. And I just want to encourage you this morning because in this season we've seen a lot of confusing words. The enemy will throw tactics of no newness. Everything according to the word of God, Ecclesiastes chapter 3 says this, that there is nothing new under the sun. Nothing new. Isn't it amazing when the church of the living God is going through the most secret place, the narrow place, we're going into a place of transformation where God is now refining and beginning to deal with this other character within us, the fallen nature, that isn't it interesting that all the confusion and the loud sound around us is trying to distract us. The enemy will cause any other element to try and distract you from the will of God. You know, and I had to learn very young in my walk. I was about 21 when God called me from the banana fields. Banyan. Yeah. Banyan. Murray was in the banana fields. And it was very challenging to hear the voice of God while I was in an environment that wasn't pleasing. When you're working 10 hour days, you know, you're working week to week, Friday to Friday, Monday to Friday, and you're just making enough to pay as you can go, and then pay your bills up, and then you're blessed, that's about it. 
But living that life cycle for about eight years solid, and I was even working after Sunday after church. I'd make sure I come to church and I'd honour God on Sunday morning. Straight after that, I would go straight out to the banana paddocks, cut about four trailers, hang them, rope them up, get it ready for the shed. Every Sunday, even after preaching. <laughs> and so it was very easy for us to go back into a pity party. But that's where God is refining you. Tell somebody this morning, I'm being refined. He will use situations that seem to be greater than what you can handle, but God is actually causing those things that are in our life or situations to refine you, your character. And so after a few months, the moaning and the groaning and the whinging got out of my language. And it was nothing. It was just, I just want to honor God. It is what it is at the moment, and I'm just going to honor God. It is what it is at the moment, and I'm going to honor God for the church of the living God all over the world. It is what it is at the moment, but we're going to honor God. Work is work, life is life, home life is home life, but what it is right now, it doesn't faze me. The ultimate thing is, is that God is in the midst of it. Revelation chapter 1 verse 20 says that he is in the midst of the candlesticks. He is in the midst. Interesting word. In the Greek, it simply means to be in a place of governance and authority. He's in the midst of your life. He wants to bring about an execution of authority and governance for the church that it might know that no matter what it's going through in the natural, in the spirit, God is God. And we're challenged day by day. You might have children, you might have little bubbers. You might be a teenager going through your teenage years. They're some of the most complicated years of, of our lives. You're discovering you, who you are and your flavor. What type of person you're gonna be, it's very interesting in those early junior years. But I wanna encourage you that in the midst of everything, is that if you put God first in your life, even while things are happening, he begins to give you instructions. And I just want to give you scripture on instructions. Listen to this. It says here in Psalms 94, verse 10, He, which meaning God, who instructs the nations, shall he not correct? So God, when he's giving this understanding this instructions in our life he's correcting things in our life that really are obstructing us it's causing us to walk in confusion and it's leading us to paths that really don't bear any fruit and when you're young and you're in your adolescence in your teenage you go down a lot of these different type of paths and you're going in and he cuts it off or something happens and he cuts this relationship or you go down this path and he stops that door and then he goes and he opens that. But this is all a part of the growing process. But to make things quicker, can I say, to make things come about more effectively, obedience to the word of God and humility will cause you to not have to go through this process too long. You don't want to be walking that type of process all your life. You get 10 years down a track in a relationship and then it all falls apart. No, you want to stay in tune with God. Humility and, and the ability to obey God will increase your walk. Two things that come out of the testing period when you go through it. And I want to give you another scripture here. There was a man called Nehemiah. And Nehemiah, when he was chosen by God to begin to build the walls, says that he was moved by God and he went into prayer and fasting, that Nehemiah began to hear the voice of God. You know, Nehemiah, in the natural, he was a man that was in a season when all of his people were in bondage. They were not in the position where they thought they should have been. And so this man began to pray and fast. And as he got into prayer and fasting, God began to talk to him. But all of his countrymen were just scattered at that time. But God had him in that place to begin to seek him. And it says in Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 20, listen to this. So after he talked to the Lord, so I answered them and said to them, The God of heaven himself will prosper, will prosper us. 
Nehemiah had a word. And that's what happens when you're with God. Many people, when they're in a trial or when they're in a season that is, it seems unfavorable, you're not getting where you want to get or you don't get what you want to get, it's very easy to turn away from God. But Nehemiah shows the nature and the character of someone who's persistent. He's prayed and he went into fasting. He sought God in the most hardest times when all of his descendants were here barred up, charred up or chained up, they were put into bondage, they were in servanthood. All of these things were going on. Jerusalem was scattered. There was no good thing around and yet he sought God. We've got to be consistent in seeking God. He is the primary voice we are looking for. No social media platform can do this. No amount of gossip will be able to sustain the vision. God's voice has to be the primary voice. Who's excited this morning? Nehemiah, he said, the God of heaven himself will prosper us. Therefore, we, his servants, will arise and build. Wow. And everyone was looking at Nehemiah. And then not only did he declare the word of the Lord, but he challenged and he corrected everything else that didn't want to come on the journey. He said, but you have no inheritance, he said. The very next portion of his words. He said, you won't have any inheritance, those who will not walk into, the, into this place where God is calling us. Nor will you have any right, nor you have any memorial in Jerusalem you will not be founded in the things of God this simply means that people will find themselves outside of what God is doing and when you're outside of what God is doing you sort of why are they blessed oh why are they getting that oh who gave them that why is this happening to them? Mm -hmm. See, the house of God is going to be unique and distinct. The favor of God is over the church of the living God. Put your hand up this morning if you're the church. You're the church. The entire body here this morning, you're a part of the church. It's not only one man, one family, one person. No, we're all a part of the body of Christ. Many members, but one body. The church of the living God is about to step into its greatest inheritance that the planet has ever seen. And I tell you what, I don't want to be outside of what God is doing. <laughs> Nothing is going to compare to the hand of God. And when he does his work, man, the word yada in the Hebrew, the hand of God, means the creativeness of God. When God puts his hand on something and he begins to work, it's the yada in the Hebrew, yada. It's the creative hand of God. See, the world is outside of this. But the church of the living God will begin the centerpiece of all things. Number one, I want you to write down what happens when we're trying to get focused with the will of God. It says in Nehemiah chapter 4 verse 2, verse, chapter 4 verse 8. It says that there was a man called Sambalat at that time and they were trying to confuse the people not to build the temple. And it says this in verse 8, And all of them conspired together to come and attack Jerusalem. The primary purpose and to create confusion. We've got to get to a place in the vision where it's the vision. Stop allowing other voices. This was a voice within. Sam Ballot was of his own people. But Sam Ballot was being used in a way that was bringing about confusion for the vision to go forward. Why? Because Sam Ballot didn't have it in his heart. He was happy. He was comforted in the area where he was. He never wanted anyone else to come into the blessing. Just him. This move is going to touch every single household. 
just declare it this morning. No, me and my household, every single one of us will walk into an inheritance. Sam Ballard, he began to create confusion in the camp. But look at this, nevertheless, we made our prayer to our God. And because of them, we set our watch against them day and night. We've got to become obtuse to the point that we understand when we're under attack and when the enemy is throwing in confusion, trying to deviate the body from the purpose of God. We've got to stay intact with God. That's a hard thing to do. Sam Ballot was a countryman. He was a Hebrew. And he had the effect to pull others out because he was of the same origins. Most of the attacks that we will go through or most of the experiences the church has been going through, some of the attacks have been within the four walls of the, of, of the church. When you're personally trying to grow, some of the closest ones that you love can be the ones that are actually stripping you apart and no one believes in you. And yet you've still got to be sweet and stay in the presence of God and walk it out. I'm trying to grow you this morning by the power of the Holy Spirit. He's the only one that's going to bring about an increase, but we need instructions for the journey. Are you all right there this morning? Second Kings, I want to give you another scripture. Second Kings, chapter 2. Second Kings chapter 2. This young man, Elijah, he was waiting with the great prophet of Elijah the prophet. And Elisha, this young man, he was waiting with him. And we know what happened. The chariot of fire came down and Elijah was taken up into the spirit. And this young man called out. He said, give me your mantle. Give me what you have. And a lot of time in church history or church understanding with doctrine, we have this concept that he was asking for the mantle. But I want to just give you a bit better understanding. He said, I want a double portion of what you had. Just using that word phrase, historically, when a Hebrew man would hand over his business to his son, he would call it the double portion of the inheritance. So what really Elisha, the young man, was asking from Elijah the prophet, he said, give me the inheritance of the firstborn. That's what he wanted. He wanted the inheritance of the firstborn. I want the rights that you have. He sought it out and he asked him. And it says, we know what happened, that because he was there, the Lord gave it to him. In 2 Kings chapter 13, he took up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen to him. And he went back and he stood on the brooks in the banks of the Jordan. Verse 14, then he took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him. He struck the waters. Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he had struck the water, it divided way, way there and that way. It split, they said, this way and that way. And Elijah crossed over. What that is a picture of is that God was with him. And that God was trying to show him, wherever you go, I will lead you now. That's a portion of the first inheritance. You will be like this. It's something that will be in your life. God will struck the waters. He will split everything in order to show you the directions in your life. He will make it clear the choices and the decisions you need to go down. But it's still up to you. Tell somebody it's up to me this morning. I still have to walk it out. I wanted everyone else to walk it out for me, but I couldn't. It wouldn't work. It wouldn't come about. That's another test, the personal test. What God has for you is for you. And you've got to walk it out. No one else can walk it out. We want everyone else to do the hard lifting and the hard yards and the walk, but you can't. You've got to go on the journey. And I taught about that last week, where 
When I went into prayer, the Lord, it was interesting, he woke me up and I couldn't go to sleep and so I went out and the Lord said, start praying. And I talked on the Hebrew word for intercession. It means to deliver a heavy blow to something. When you go into intercession in the spirit, you are going to war. You're hitting something in that demonic realm. Something that has been stopping you from going forward. That's what prayer does. It's what intercession does. It goes to war in the spirit dimension. You're not battling with people. You're not battling with um, flesh and blood. But you're warring against principalities that are lodged in heavenly places. Says the word of God. So I never take an attack personal. I'm not dealing with the person. It's a spirit. When you get that mindset, you know. Jesus, when he looked at Peter, what did he say? Satan, get behind me. He saw it was a spirit in Peter. Peter was a man who walked with him, loved him, cut fish with him, laid beside him. Seen him do signs and wonders, and yet Jesus turned him into a dragon. Get behind me, Satan. He looked at the spirit of what was working through Peter. That's another personal test. To know how to love people, even in their imperfections. And to be able to deliver the word of God, to know when it's a spirit and when it's just, you might have a personal problem with the person, but you've got to know that it's a spirit most of the time. And it's challenging. But we can overcome. We can overcome. We can overcome, says the word of God. So it was interesting when the Lord took us into prayer and the Lord said, I want you to walk it out now because I said, Lord, this cannot go on. Something is blocking here. And the Lord said, I want you to walk along Meridian Road until you get to the light post. And I went to the light post and then I stopped and the Lord said, stop, turn around and I want you to walk out the other area. And then the Lord took me up to a street called Carmel Street, the place of abundancy. And the Lord had to declare it and I had to speak the word continually what the Lord is saying in the spirit. He doesn't stop speaking. He hasn't stopped speaking. He hasn't stopped doing what he wants us to do. I tell you what, God is always actively moving. You've just got to get in position with him. And so I went into Carmel Street and the Lord told me to walk there and I went in there and that's the place of abundancy and I went through an experience with God. Does anyone know what abundance feels like? You want to know what it feels like? It feels like water running all over you. I used to jump in the car. As soon as I felt, I knew it in my own being. I knew when God was speaking about there's a season or an hour of abundance coming. Get ready. I'd get in the car and would, all the kids would get in the car and say, get in quickly. God wants us to drive past somewhere. And we're going to call it out. That's the house God's going to give us. We get in that car and drive two way. And they're all looking at me. Eh? Dad, what are you doing? I said, the Lord said, get ready. Just keep on praying, drive past the property, keep on praying over it. Put a spear into that country there where God wants you to put it. And we drive back and forward, back and forward, and surely, according to the word of God, it came to pass. That's how it is. He works through you. Sometimes he uses people around you, but most prominently, when God wants to talk to you, he will talk through you. You'll pick up a feeling, get it in your gut sometime, get it in that ear, get a sense of it, your conscience picks up on it, get the understanding of it, the intent is known, and you know, oh, the Lord really wants me to say, I've got to go bless this person. And in, in the natural eyes, it wasn't a person that I wanted to bless, but the Lord said, go and bless her. I'm freeing you up. I'm freeing you up. Envy, jealousy, malice, all of these are outside of Jerusalem. It will not inhabit God's people. This nature, God will not allow to inhabit us. Amen? So the next part 
it was a bit interesting because I walked past this house we got. The Lord said, you know, I want you to walk back home now. So I'm walking back home along Coronation. Who knows Coronation? Yeah, Coronation, a bit scary, eh? a bit dark sometimes. Eh? You know, Murray's used to, you know, that dark, eh? we'll run down that road quickly, eh? Walking really quickly. Don't look anywhere, eh? just walk. Eh? Don't look back, just walk. So I started walking and the Lord said, walk towards that area, the coronation. You know what coronation speaks about in the Hebrew? It was when a time when a king would be crowned, his position. That's what coronation means. Every king who has ever been named king gets a coronation. So they have a big ceremony, it's called the coronation of a king. That's where he receives his crowning authority to tell everyone on, on the planet or in the nation, he's now king. And whatever he says now is law. So I'm walking and the Lord says, turn to coronation. So I go to coronation now and I'm sitting there and it just hit me and dawned me. Sometimes in life we have not really understood or we haven't personally got this, that he is king of kings. He's the ruler, he's the power, he's the one who sets the boundaries for the habitat of his people. When you're outside of God and you don't know him, you don't know the laws of citizenships of the kingdom. You don't understand how God works. But the Lord was saying to me, we're coming into a season now where we're inside these gates. We know who is the king, who is the Lord of lords, who's the host of hosts. We understand the laws of his word. Oh. When you understand him, you become a citizen. That's why Paul said that to the Corinthians. He said, you are now a citizen of Israel. You understand what it means to be under this law, under this power, under the authority of Yeshua. You don't live your life to principles outside of it. To the church of the living God, we're no longer being outside of God's law. We are not determined. The season is not determined upon the church by the world. Social media will not dictate the vision of God. No, the Spirit of God is the one who is in the coronation. He is God. Very hard for the, those who are outside of the vision of God. I'm starting to preach a little bit now. Pastor Manny, Uncle Manny, a little bit of preaching there. Just get excited. I'm shouting it out to the four corners of the earth. Bellow it out. Make it known. Second Kings, I want to give you the scripture. Second Kings chapter 2, verse 15. See, this young man, Elisha, now was moving in the double portion of the inheritance, sonship. The fullness of now what God was going to do would come through him. And so he's walking, he struck the waters, and the Lord is now taking him to new places. He comes to the place where the sons of the prophets who were from Jericho saw him. And the spirit of Elijah was now resting upon him. And there's so much we can talk about the spirit of Elijah. The spirit of Elijah has manifested itself not just once in scripture, it's manifested it multiple times in scripture. Oh, where, Pastor Manny? Had it on this young man, Elisha. The spirit of Elijah was upon him. It happened to another man in the New Testament called John the Baptist. And it's going to happen to a company, a ministry, before the coming of the king. The spirit of Elijah will be a ministry upon a company of people. They came to him and met with him. They bowed to the ground before him. They said to him, look now, there's 50 strong men with servants. Everyone say 50. 
speaks about Pentecost. I just want those who are in the church age to understand Pentecost was a beautiful feast and it came in the fullness of time. God has given us it. But God wanted that feast to empower us. To empower us. Gives us gifts. Gave us the fivefold ministry. Gave us the evidence of speaking in tongues, the ability to prophesy, word of knowledge, revelation, instructions, doctrine. He gave us this beautiful feast called Pentecost. But it wasn't to be the end desire or the end result of God. And we're going to see in Scripture the result of when you're just at Pentecost. And you don't go on into inheritance. It says that the 50 prophets of Jer Jericho, it says that they went to Elijah and look what they did to him. They begin to talk to him. And they said, look now, please let them go. Let us go and search for your master. At least perhaps the spirit of the Lord has taken him up onto a mountain and cast him there or into some valley. Let us go and look for him. He said to them, you shall not go any one of you. See, when the spirit of adoption, when inheritance is being declared to the church, it's not time to run out to look for a previous move. It's no more time to go back and look for a previous anointing. It's no time now to move outside. It's time to look forward. Amen. Tell somebody this morning, I'm going to look forward in God. The new things of God are in front of us. They're not behind us. They're set before us. Don't go out, he tried to tell them. But look, verse 17, but they urged him till he became ashamed of them. They begged him to go back. Just let us, let us pick up something. Let us go and search for this great man. And Elisha, they, they couldn't pick up on the spirit of what God was doing. There's a new season. It's dawned on you. It's time to pick up. It's time to move. I'm going to do new miracles. I'm going to work in the earth in a new way. But yet they didn't want that. They wanted to go back to this looking for this previous expression of God. If I can say it to this morning, stop looking for the previous expressions what you were in. Look to new things. He become ashamed of them. And he said eventually he sent them. The 50 men went and they searched how many days? How many days? How many days? Three is very powerful in scripture. While this time they were looking, they were looking for a previous expression. But in the three days they should have been getting prepared for the season ahead of them. But they were out position now. They were outside what God wanted to do. And the only one who was in tune was it was those who had this double portion on them. The sons, the inheritance. The church of the living God, we're going into inheritance now. We're not going back to just drips of seasons of the anointing. No, we're going into inheritance. God is going to open up, and I declare it this morning, Australia, the Spirit of God, is releasing inheritance. Amen. Oh, I'm excited. <laughs> he urged them and said, Go your way, ashamedly. They searched for three days and couldn't find him. When they came back to him, for he had stayed in Jericho, he said to them, Did I not say to you, do not go? Three words that we're going to need to hold dear in the house of God. Do not go. I've been challenged everywhere. <laughs> oh, 
Isn't it amazing when you're going into your inheritance, every, everything is wanting you to go in some form or shape. Whether it's business, governance, life, family, marriage, relationship, everything is telling you, just, just go. Just go. What will just going do? Cut you short of the inheritance. You'll never know what it is to express who you really are in Christ. There will always be an absence in you. It's too hard, it's too difficult. No, that's not the language of the spirit of life. You've got to throw that out of your mouth. You've got to talk what the word of God is. I've been called for this season. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. God's got me here for some reason in the scripture. Let's just go with it. <laughs> The men of the city said to verse 19 to Elijah, please notice the situation of this city. It's pleasant as my Lord sees it, but the water is bad and the ground is barren. Water is bad, ground is barren. Water speaks about influence or life giving. The ground is supposed to produce something. But if the water is not right, the earth won't give up its resources. There's a flow in us that has to take place, a flow of His Spirit. When the water and the flow is right, guess what happens to the ground? Your life, it produces. What is it producing, Pastor Man? This character. It's already been made, it sits up in the Spirit for you, but it has to break through. Have you ever seen an orange tree in such stress to bring forth the fruit? I learned something interesting. I bought this house for our daughters and out the front of our driveway is a Chinese lychee tree. I didn't know it was Chinese in its origins. But I looked at it and I said, these lychees are different from that other lychee I'm used to seeing. Big, fat lychees. These are little, narrow lychees. But they had big seeds but very little fruit, flesh in it. But they were lychees, but they're a different type. And I looked at it and I said, why aren't they producing any, you know, big, nice, lush things? And a guy came to me and he said, oh, you know what you got to do? You got to put the tree into stress mode. I said, hey, how do you do that? I said, how do you do that? I said, do you cut it? Thing like, he said, no, 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 because it, it's, it's fruiting. But you need to just put it into a stress mode. You need to create the environment as if the tree is being attacked. I said, oh yeah, how you do that? He reckoned, oh, you just get a big star picket and drive it straight into the root. I said, won't that kill it? He said, no, you know what it does? It wounds it and it puts itself then into a different mode. The tree changes its structure inside of its mentality. What will it do? It will think it's under attack, so we will go full blown into harvest. Come on this morning. Some of us need the pick to go in. We need the word of God to go into us to say it's time to grow up in the situation. Stop dropping back. And going back, it's too hard. I can't deal with the pastor man. No, it's time to go into maturity. Mm. That was, that just hit me. I said, thank you, brother. Thank you for that. I did not know that. But it altered the intent of the tree to trick it to say that you're at war. You're going to fly or you're going to die. Mm. <laughs> he said, bring me a new bowl. Give me something creative, something that you've never seen before. Bring me that new bowl. Put the salt in it. So they brought it to him. And when he went out to the source of the water, he cast the salt into the water. And he said, thus saith the Lord, I have healed this water. And it is there shall be no more death nor barrenness. So the water remains till this day, according to the word of God, it is healed. Amen. 
It was all because of the word. There's a word in you. And if it's coming from God, a good flow, it's going to heal. It's going to heal you. It's going to heal the situations. And it's not only just going to be this season we're coming into, it's not just going to be a heal and revert, heal and revert. No, this is going to set a, a seal on it. You're not going to go back into the old way again. Your season is changing, tell someone this morning. So I went to coronation and I'm going to finish with this. Can I have the musicians up? So I walked down coronation. Walked back now, I'm coming back. Got to the house and I just sat down. Just pondering on the things and, you know, wifey came out and she said, is everything all right, Manny? I said, yeah, I, uh, I said, I just need to talk to him. I just want to talk to him. And um, she knows when it's that time and things like that. So this is about three o'clock in the morning. And I go inside and usually I write my thoughts down. I write my thoughts down, what's, what's God saying? And I got into bed then and the next morning I woke up. And for some reason it was like the Lord said, excellent, but now is coming the fasting. And I said, oh, okay, Lord. What is fasting? Fasting, number one, it may be absence of food. But the principle of it is that, is that you're not indulging in the flesh. That's the principle of fasting. That's why Jesus said to his disciples, when the master has come, there'll be no more longer fasting. There'll be no need to fast any longer. He was trying to teach them the principle is that when the master has come to you, there should be no more desire for the indulgence of the things of the flesh. Because all you want is him. All you desire is him. In your life, in your marriage, in your decision making, all you want is to sure is that he's the centerpiece. And um, so I said, oh, Lord, how long is this going to go on for? And he said, one month. And I said, oh, Lord. So I did my first week this week. He said, yeah, I only had one meal. So I had my first meal last night. Everything else is just water. I'm, I'm excited because I know he's preparing us for the next part. We haven't gone this far for no reason. So he's going to prepare us to have a word, to see the direction, and to point it out openly where God is leading us. This morning, I'm telling you what, you might be challenged in that area in your life. I'm, get with God, put your hand and get a part of the vision. I try to tell people, what happens when you get a part of the vision in the church? It means to put your hands to it. You know, when everyone put their hands to it, guess what happens, eh, Moses? It looks beautiful. The grounds look beautiful. The church looks beautiful. Our impact in the community is beautiful. The witness is beautiful. It just, it's, it, the smell just ambiates everywhere. On a greater scale. Next Sunday, come. I really want to push this vision in the next part where God wants to say. He told me to drive past down a property. I said, Lord, how are we going to do this? He told us housing. Our people need houses. How are we going to get this done? He's got the plan. We just got to get in position. Who's ready for it? He's not done yet, tell somebody. He's not done. Ah, oh, Lord, I see these young ones. Man, they're going to be managers, business managers. They'll look after all the houses, properties. I can't wait to see that day. I can't wait to see that day. Our children in places of position of authority, governance. Amen. What was the three words he said to them? Do not go. Stay attached to the head. For in the head 
the body will receive all of its nourishment. I cannot encourage you enough. No matter what I've been trialed through and tested, I've never let go of the head. Never let go of what God's given you and where you are. I tell you that much. It will put you in good stead. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Can you give God a clap this morning? <laughs> Hallelujah. Let's stand. Next week we've got a youth outing, don't we, Mr. Jordy? Yeah, we've got a big youth outing. It's going to be exciting. We've got a big excursion this week for the whole college. It's going to be awesome. We're going down a Lacey excursion to Mission Beach. It's just going to be fantastic. If you want to get involved in the vision, come, come to the school. Come to the church. Come to see the principal. Ask, how can I be used? I'm here. I want to help out. Any shape, any form. Any shape or any form. I just want to be involved with what God has. There's over 70, 80 students that need ministering to. You could be that person God needs. You got that in your heart? Praise the Lord, it's right there. Hallelujah. And then sing with the song. Go bless somebody. Love yous. And see yous next week.